Right now we have the perfect number of people for Hollywood Squares or the Brady Bunch. All right, we'll give some others a minute or two, <laughs> then we'll we'll get going. We're up and running on YouTube now. Okay, recording so. Whenever, whenever we're ready to go, we can go. One more minute. I think Kate, Susan, and John are the ones I don't see right now. I just re, uh, I'm, I'm getting some link requests. So I'm sending those right now to folks. Um, I don't apologize. I don't know if I did that incorrect or what. Michael Flake gets gets props for repurposing of t-shirts. Uh, and, and a Memphis hoodie. Oh, look at that, too. Yeah. I'm a sucker for a free t-shirt. Kate's, Kate's delay is uh, my fault. I was using her as the test. Um, I was I was trying to put all this in a spreadsheet and get it to automatically import to Zoom so I didn't have to type this out every time. And I was using Kate as the test and <laughs> somehow forgot her once I got it all figured out. So she's on her way. Gotcha. Okay. Well, we've got a decent tailwind tonight, so we'll make up some time. Trey, do you know, is John also waiting for a link? I do like the the um, piloting reference, though, Matt. I think that might be the second meeting in a row. I, I didn't hear if you answered about John. Is he waiting for a link? Oh, I'm sorry. I don't see a message from John. Okay. Well, we'll get going. And if he jumps on here, we'll, we'll he'll be up to speed automatically. So good evening, everyone. Um, we'll call this meeting to order. This is the Town of Davidson Planning Board meeting for Monday, March 29th, 2021. The time is 6.04 p.m. We have a quorum. The only two members currently not present are John Swope and Lindsay Williams. I understand Lindsay will be absent tonight. Hopefully John will be able to join us shortly. Um, we do not have any changes to the agenda that I'm aware of. Trey, any changes? No. Okay. Um, first item is the review and approval of the minutes from our January 25th, 2021 meeting, since we did not have a February meeting. Hopefully everyone had a chance to review those ahead of time. And once we are ready, if there are no requested changes, I just need a motion to approve. Motion to approve. And a second. Second. Okay, so the motion from Ellen and a second from Bill. All those in favor, show of hands. 
Okay, that's everyone. Thank you very much. First item on new business, is, this is an FYI presentation of uh, anticipated amendments, text amendments to our ordinance uh, based on chapter 160D of the North Carolina statutes. Let's make sure that those align. I think Trey is gonna walk us through this. Trey, you wanna take it away? Yes, I will. So this is just to get you all familiar with what you will see a couple more times. Um, and if you tuned into the commissioner's meeting last week, then you would have seen the same presentation, but <clears throat> we've mentioned it before and, and you all will see this coming forward in the coming months and be asked to comment on it. We have a series of text amendments that are actually required by the state uh, legislature, state law that's come out, and it's largely a reorganization of planning development regulations in, in North Carolina and how they're structured. So this is the background. Um, it's long overdue. I, I chuckled to myself actually preparing for this and saw that, that the second bullet point acknowledges that this is the first wholesale reorganization since 1905, mm -hmm. which is hard to fathom. But uh, this, I think, is, brings a lot of welcome changes. And due to the pandemic, we've been given an extension in terms of when we have to implement this. But uh, in you know, we have until July 1st to implement it. And so staff has been working to prepare text amendments for your all's review for the Board of Commissioners review. And that will take place in April and May. Uh, and we will reorganize the our ordinance based on that. Um, you may recall that some of this was already seen back in December uh, related to variances. And, and it was important that we were in line with that particular section uh, sooner rather than later. And so that change was reviewed by you all, I believe in November, and then commissioners adopted it in December of last year. Uh, basically, there's a lot of reorganization, updating of terminology that, that will take place. Uh, there's a little bit of clarification provided regarding what happens when a parcel straddles the jurisdictional line. Um, and so there's guidance on that. And then a couple changes to governing boards so our advisory board or excuse me our um our elected officials specifically there will be con uh, conflict of interest standards included for not only them but also advisory boards and oaths that all people serving in our community will take uh, we will also ensure that the etj is proportionally represented and according to this guidance um, we already have two etj rep members represented on this advisory board this is simply codifying uh, that in in our ordinance. There will also be some information included regarding any conflicts of interest that staff may have and how to issue notice of when NOVs are notice of violations and how to do so in a, in a um, consistent manner. Um, and this is, I think, big picture statewide so that different jurisdictions are doing it in a similar fashion that people are getting treated equally and consistently across different jurisdictions. Uh, there are a number of actual zoning changes. Bullet point two is interesting. It will eliminate the use of conditional use zoning. That's less interesting to us in that we don't have conditional uses, right? Any, because we have planning areas that have uses and land use standards included in one, um, whereas other jurisdictions will have a use and a, uh, and um, the form and, and different setbacks, set, et cetera, separate from that use. And so that's a big change statewide, but it doesn't impact us as much. Uh, there's a few other standards in here that will standardize processes, make sure that we're in compliance with state statute. The last bullet point we've taken care of, we already have a comprehensive plan in place and have uh, since 2010 was our, our first comprehensive plan, but a lot of communities in the state don't. And so this will um, I would say nudge, but it's more than a nudge, I guess, to say that they have to have it done by 2022 according to state law. But everybody will start moving in that direction. Again, so there's clear policy guidance regarding planning development, economic development, other things across the state and different communities. A few changes to legislative decisions, um, but some of which, again, you've already been doing. Uh, we, you know, we already have noticing requirements for MAP amendments. Uh, we already do consistency statements. We've been very practiced at that. Um, and I guess all jurisdictions have not been doing that or not been doing it consistently. So this is further clarifying that. And then same with quasi-judicial decisions. 
Uh, we've had a lot of practice this year. Many of you have had a lot of practice on these types of decisions. And there will be an update to how, how those types of hearings and, and cases are handled. Lastly, further clarity will be provided on uh, how administrative decisions can be approved and how all the mechanics of that will work. Um, again, you know, so be clear when you see the specific text amendments that are approved. Some changes also to vested rights uh, that we'll discuss later. And then actually how does judicial review occur for certificates of appropriateness and landmarks? Those are specifically in local historic districts and how that process works. Uh, number of staff back in January 2020 attended training uh, actually down at the, the Central Line of Council of Governments in Charlotte on all these changes. Uh, we have a very thick workbook that we're moving through that describe these changes in detail. Uh, the School of Government's been a great assist, uh, as, uh, providing great assistance in this regard. Um, we will also make sure that we will the town attorney will you know, review the changes as, as happens with all text amendments as we move through this process. So here's the schedule in writing, um, looking at you know, May uh, for the commissioner's hearing and then planning board recommendation for that. Uh, I think it's the third Monday in May. Remember fourth Monday is uh, Memorial Day. So we'll be meeting a week earlier and then looking to June to adopt uh, these standards uh, before July 1st deadline. And with that, I will leave it open to any questions that folks have. Trey, I have a quick one. Um, it, it looks like we're being asked for a recommendation in May. Are we going to see the actual text amendments next month? I believe that that is the schedule we're on. So that you would have two meetings on which to comment. And then that that full month in between to provide maybe some more substantive recommendations. Okay. Ellen. And remember to unmute yourselves. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> do y'all, um, uh, do you expect any need for involvement by PBOC on the changes or is the staff gonna kind of take care of it? I think staff will take the lead on this, but we'll certainly have the public discussion in, um, at the planning board meeting mm -hmm. and uh jason's currently the lead on this so i'm not 100 percent sure on whether or not he plans to utilize or how he plans to utilize pbock i know that since there's growth management moving on a parallel track i think that yep. is maybe where more of the focus will lie okay since, thank you yeah and these are a lot of this is just making sure we're in alignment with state statute yeah. that's what i figured yep thank you mm -hmm. other questions from anyone Hard to have questions when we don't have any substance right now, but Bill. Agreed. All right, now I'm unmuted. Um, Trey, is this a, uh, just a reorganization and that uh, various, you know, sections are being moved around in the code or is this a, are they rewriting or introducing new sections? You know, I'm not sure the full big picture on whether or not there's rewriting involved or if this, I mean, I think we will probably have the opportunity to change things as we evaluate what needs to be done. And that's currently what we're in the process of doing. But as the slide showed, it's, it's largely a making sure cross references are correct, making sure that yeah. if we have a, a reference to conditional use, which we don't, but making sure that that's taken out. Um, so it's, it's, I don't believe that you'll see a wholesale rewrite of, of the ordinance as part of this. Okay, thank you, Trey. Others? Okay, well, we'll see it again next month. So um, we'll ask some questions then, I'm sure, if, if they are necessary. So thanks, Trey. We'll move okay. on to the next item, which is our first item of old business. And this is the East Rocky River Road Master Plan. Again, this is just an FYI presentation. Trey's gonna walk us through this. No actions required from us tonight.
Trey, I'm not sure. You may be talking, but you're muted. Uh oh, did, did, did he drop? Trey, I can see you. Okay. Okay. Um, he's just having a little bit of technical issues. He'll get that wrapped up. Um, I don't know that there's anything necessarily that, that we can cover in the interim. I guess we could switch to other items, but let's just give him a second. Maybe he'll get his screen back going. Um, I can filibuster just a little bit more. There oh, you go. Yeah. All right. That brought me enough time. Yeah. Sorry about that. Perfect. So much somehow um, adobe pdf really wanted to be front and center to the point where i could not see anything else on my main screen and that was where my zoom platform was located so i <laughs> was struggling to communicate thanks for buying me some time matt i'm pulling the uh, east rocky river master plan up right now Okay, here we go. So first, th we're talking about East Rocky River Master Plan. I just wanted to make sure you all were familiar with where this is. I think we, you know, we talked about this in November uh, and we're out near what's called Summit River Run. Sh folks should be seeing an aerial of our jurisdiction. Okay, and yeah, then this is the intersection of East Rocky River Road and Shear Road. So this is that parcel here um, next to the Summit River Run. So I just wanted to locate that for you all, and I will do it. Will now show you the plan itself. So this is East Rocky River Road coming here. This is Summit River Run. Remember, these are six uh, single-family detached homes that are planned as part of this. And there, it actually may look like the site plan that you saw before, but it's not. Um, the whole thing is actually shifted a little bit north. If you recall from the previous. Uh, review the the intersection was not aligned um, for a number of reasons mainly due to site topography the developers decided to shift these everything to the north and that is actually creates better intersection alignment the public safety and public works were okay with the previous alignment being a little offset given that traffic is anticipated to be relatively low volume on this area but it does create a better alignment another advantage is that the BMP, so stormwater rainwater management device has shifted out of existing forest area and it can be built in an area that currently I don't think features as many or, or any trees. Um, and that underscores that we have been working closely with the arborist on this proposal. We were actually out last fall and reviewing a lot of these things when they were, were tentative. So this is the plan that they came back with based on that site visit and based on um, initial feedback they've had from Mucklenburg County and Town of Davidson through technical reviews. The trail uh, up here that's going to wind throughout the site and actually connect to Davidson Farms down here is also shifted north. And we've discovered too that the greenway can likely run in the existing power utility easement. So that should actually, it was typically, you're usually running here on the edge, but uh, we were able to shift it north and run it in the power easement to avoid additional loss of trees. We are targeting a public input session probably for late April on this. And so you all will see announcements about that through our usual channels. I don't have anything else to say, but this is technically a new plan. I know it looks almost identical to the previous one. Um, and I just wanted to keep you all in the loop uh, that this is still moving forward and we're still reviewing it and uh, working with the project team on it. Questions from the board? Nora? Is a detention pond the only possible way they can deal with their stormwater? Yeah, I, I hear you. I mean, I it, it's sand filter. It's every time sand filter, sand filter, sand filter. And you can't plant in sand Those filters. are large lot homes. Like you could easily yeah. contain we, the stormwater using yeah. vegetation. I, I had it. I had an interesting um, 
I had an interesting conversation with Pete Grice with our arborist today about that because we've been rec trying to figure out how to um, get a little more detail on our um, on our tree calculations because you know we've now got East Rock River Road, Boulder Rock Loop, and a couple other ones that are now working under the new ordinance. And one of the things that we've tried to figure out is can they can they exclude the BMP and what's called SDE storm drainage easement easement areas from their calculations of what they would be required to plant? Because if you ask the engineers that are doing this conventional kind of development, oh, we can't plant in here. Well, when you get dig down into it, that's not the case for all rainwater management practices. And to your point, Nora, it's it's the conventional approach, I think is long overdue for a reckoning on, on collecting and getting off site. That's a, that's a very antiquated way of dealing with rainwater. And having worked at USGBC for a number of years, the, if you look at the current versions of the lead rating system, they don't even use stormwater, they use rainwater, trying to change the psychology that this is a nuisance to be shunted off site because of changes that we made to the site versus this is a resource that falls on the site that we can capture and manage in different ways to the benefit of the site and surrounding sites. So that was a long way of saying, uh, I don't like it either. Um, th it is an available um, treatment strategy for them, but we, I think through working with the arborists have some ideas on how we can maybe start to approach that differently. Because if that's not being credited to them as area that they don't have to plant, then that might start to change the calculation literally on how they want to make decisions on their site. So I think that's the way that we're looking at doing this. And it seems like, I mean, like with developments like this, if there was a way, I'm going to beat my drum here, but and sort of incentive as a, a, a carrot for them to innovate, right? Um, this seems like a perfect place at Boulder Rock Loop, same, similar, right? To do some of those things. Yeah, and I think, you know, you're to point back to the work of the sustainability committee is I think we're on that path to try to figure out a different way to do this. And I would hope that it would involve some code changes that would, um, I know you, it, absolutely incentive is the right place, it is, is always desirable. Um, I think in this case, we're dealing with a, an outdated set of regulations that just need to be updated in and of themselves. And so to me, the, the floor needs to be raised in this case too. Um, Cause we're, we're not gonna get, unless we start applying incentives that we don't have, namely money to this, you know, and we've talked a little bit about that and maybe what that could do. And any of those conversations are going on, but it, from my standpoint, this should just be a floor that they're meeting irrespective of whether or not they're, uh, you know, it, well, I think, it's, I think it's hard. I mean, when sand filters are what they're used to and it's an accepted, you know, BMP, then it's going to be hard to, to get that sort of change without, you know, sweetening the. I don't think it has to be monetary. I mean, I feel like there's bound to be a way to improve the process or allow them. I, I don't know what, you know, but there, there's, there has to be. But anyway, we're on the same page. Yep. Yeah, well, I mean, I appreciate it when you bring it up. I know you, oh, I'm beating my drum, whatever. I'm able to go back to the project team now and say, look, our planning board is talking about this. They, like, you know, you're going to hear this again. We might as well start working on it now. You're hearing it from our arborists. You're hearing it from our planning board. You know, you need to figure out something else. So it is helpful for you br to bring it up, and I appreciate it. Other thoughts, Sean? Um, before I ask the question, just to comment on that last thing. I mean, remember, that's sort of how we, part of how we ended up with, we're now looking at the prospect of eight affordable units at Hope. We started Yeah, that, that actually crossed my mind too. Yeah, it, it, like I said, the things, you know, it may not seem like we have regulations or the leverage in place, but when you all bring these things up, it, it, we're able as staff to share that this is something that our community re really values and they're going to be looking for it. So my, so my question was, who's, who is the developer on this? This is a, um, a guy named Andy Wilfong, and it's I think it's just a dad and son group tandem. Um, I think his dad purchased the property, and Andy is the one executing it. Okay. Yep. 
Thanks. Anyone else? Trey, I have a question about that trail, the um, six foot pedestrian trail. He said that on the, whatever that is, west side maybe, where it's gonna connect to the Davidson Farms trail. Uh, this is probably way too early. You probably don't have these details, but I'm curious since we are stepping into the floodplain area, um, what that trail, which is intended that, to be equestrian friendly, what it's in, envisioned as being. It's in, intended to be, you know, six foot compact earth, not, not any legitimate, you know, paving or anything of that nature. Okay. Is, is, there, is there a foresight that might need to be applied on it connecting to the greenway and whether the greenway is equestrian friendly? I don't know. It's interesting that, that you mentioned that. I mean, I, it, it's that's why I'm glad we have these conversations because honestly, that that had never crossed my mind. Um, the if you if you for those of you involved in the rural area plan, if you reach way back in your memory, the west branch of the Rocky River, that section of the Greenway, so essentially the Greenway coming out of Aversham and Fisher Farm, was contemplated as being not just a a asphalt path, but also a bridle path running alongside it. Um, we've never seen anything like that materialize, but um, that could be an interesting idea to consider here. And how do you get how do you get folks that maybe are using this long term if the west branch of the Rocky River path is over here and there is a bridal trail there? How do we actually get those horses across? So interesting. I will I will chew on that and talk to colleagues about that. So, so almost similar question mm -hmm. um, or, or same question, but, but similar going south along or I guess east on East Rocky River where you need to cross the ever widening river there each time it floods. Um, I know that the narrow passage folks had to put payment and lieu in for that bridge based on the cost. I'm assuming that is still kind of a... Um, Kind of a wishful thinking that bridge is going to come anytime soon. Do we know any idea of how that greenway connecting south is, is looking? Uh, we touched on this a couple meetings ago, uh, or maybe January meeting, but there are there are folks working on behalf of the town, uh, stakeholders in the community to make those um, that connection not, possible. On not, those not, not the connections, not the connections up to Fisher Farm. You mean across the west branch of the river from Summit River Run to Narrow Passage where the current greenway is? Correct. Yeah, no, that's but, not being worked on at the moment, but I hear you saying we should probably be working on that if we're gonna connect this. Well, I mean, I'm just, uh, yeah. It, it, I don't know how else they're gonna get up to this part of the road from where that greenway comes from Fisher Farm and Narrow Passage from that side of East Rocky River safely. Um, on we a have, very busy stretch of East Rocky River. Yeah, what what I think the protocol and Andrew, tell me if if you know more about this than I do, but um, I believe so. We have collected a payment from Narrow Passage in lieu of building that bridge. I believe we connected a payment from Summit River Run as well, and I've been trying to confirm that um, it's on my to do list. I think what we would do is pair those two payments together and approach Mecklenburg County and say, we've got this much money to start towards this project. And we would then get it on their capital improvements plan for the greenways and that they would partner with us to help execute that. Andrew, I don't know if you've seen them funded differently or similarly. That's what we had talked about a few years ago with this particular bridge across the West Branch of the Rocky River. Uh, I, think you're, I think you're online with what you just said. Yep. It, so we wouldn't hopefully have to bear the full cost or even maybe the majority of the cost if we could bring the county on as a partner. But point, point noted, Matt, there, we should step back further from this project in terms of what trails and the greenway we're building on this project and, and what do we need to be doing in the vicinity right now too. Okay. Are there other, other questions or thoughts from anyone? Janice? I just had a quick question. I was trying to read it sideways. What was the lot size on those lots? Yeah, let me. 0.2 acres is what it yeah. says. Point two? Okay. Yeah, 0.2. Okay. I couldn't tell if it was a two or a seven. Thank you. Nope, 0.2, yep. 
others? Okay, it is just an FYI, we don't have to take any action tonight and we'll see it again. All right, so that takes us down to our other items, which I don't think we have anything. Trey, remind me. No, we okay. don't. We have a number of items under the planning staff report that Andrew and I will tackle together. Yep, so let's move to that. Let's do the planning staff report. Okay, so just saying we've got, we've got four sections. We've got some things in the sections, just so you know. Um, we're gonna start with board of adjustment. And I know this, this board has been very active this year, much more so than in previous years where we used to average one case a year. Um, and so because not everybody serves on every board, we wanted to give some updates. And just to let you know how this will go, this is not, this is an update, it's not a discussion item. And we are simply going to read the summaries of the results that have been shared internally. So everybody's on the same page. We will also then share with you two upcoming Board of Adjustment cases as well. Okay, and particularly on the first two that I'm seeing is summaries, Hoke and Potts. These are still active projects in terms of, you know, Hoke is a master plan, continue to move forward. The affordable housing plan is, is under review right now. And then POTS is still in litigation. So I just want everybody to be aware of that as we just, um, share this. So the Hoke variance, the update is the Board of Adjustment approved the request for a minor variance to allow 51.7% build upon area for the Hoke master plan project. So they're allowed 50%. They were given an extra 1.7% by the Board of Adjustment two conditions that stormwater created from additional impervious area, that extra 1.7% be treated to the greatest extent that the site will allow, and that all eight affordable housing units, as well as other elements shown are constructed per the approved master plan. That may be, a, that last one may be a little bit of an update to you all. We went from two units, two affordable housing units to three, and now we're at eight. And so there's a lot of, been a lot of good momentum on that, and we, and the, or the adjustment condition their extra their approval of that extra 1.7 percent of built upon area to make that happen on those units being included in the plan so that's the hoke update um, for you and as i said the affordable housing plan is still underway and we anticipate uh, they've submitted their master plan they had to get that board of adjustment variance letter and resubmit their master plan for the county to approve it so that's, that's underway. And then after that, they need their affordable housing plan approved and construction documents approved. So that's underway. Are there any, I, I talked about the board of adjustment case, but then I also talked about some process things. Are there any questions regarding that? Okay. Um, and many thanks, because there's a number of people involved on this board as stakeholders in this conversation that have really been helpful in moving this forward. So thank you to those that have been doing that because the town and our community would not be in the position that it's in without the effort of those people. So POTS, this is the summary. Beginning in early February and concluding in mid-March, the Board of Adjustment heard the applicant's appeal, um, applicant's Crescent Communities. They heard the appeal of the planning director's denial of the Pot Street residential master plan. The Board of Adjustment approved the applicant's appeal with a number of conditions attached to the approval. So in short, these conditions require that the applicant, the developer, comply with the town's review comments specific to the building G setbacks, the multi-use path grade, so its steepness of angle, uh, unit entrances on the buildings, phasing of the project, and edits to the public input session report. And they have to comply with those as part of the construction document phase. Additionally, the applicant must secure water or sewer approval from the town or a court of law, as well as provide a second vehicular access to the development from a street other than Pot Street. So water sewer connection is required either from the town of Davidson or should a court of law find that the, the town of Davidson doesn't have the right to withhold sewer approval in this particular case, then that would also satisfy. And then a second vehicular connection it cannot be on Pot Street, so it would either need to go north to Catawba Avenue or connect south through Cornelius. 
Those are the stipulations of that. The decision is subject to a potential appeal to superior court. So that was a lot, but are there any clarifying questions that need a response? Okay. Upcoming Board of Adjustment cases, the um, COD is, well, and also similar to Hoke, a thank you to those that served uh, <laughs> on POTS. Um, Cause that was a, that was a long haul. Yes, Susan. Um, do you know where things stand in terms of their, if they've indicated if they're gonna go to the superior court? I do not know. But again, thank you to those, that was a marathon um, and it was a very trying marathon <laughs> to be sure. So thank you to those that served on that. Cottage is built upon area averaging. So that's upcoming on this Wednesday. And if you recall, Davidson Cottages was approved in, on October 26th of 2020 by the Board of Commissioners. You all looked at it a number of times. That's that project on Davidson Gateway Drive, just south of Woody's. And there's four affordable units included as part of that. And in order to actually build that project, they need to save land at 956 Shearer Street and transfer that built upon area over to 209 Davidson Gateway Drive. Um, and so there's, this is a required step following that approved conditional master plan and it's scheduled for this Wednesday, March 31st at 6 p.m. Any questions on, on that? Okay. And then lastly, Walnut Street, uh, we received an application. Andrew, would you describe that for us and, and the status of where that is right now? Yes, yeah, so we received an application for uh, just a, a street variance, which um, I know we haven't really seen that in front of the Board of Adjustment in a while. We've had some interesting cases in front of you, but this one is just a straight variance, um, basically for fence height and um, in the size of a garage. Um, this is kind of, as Trey had mentioned back in December when the 160D section that was updated for quasi-judicial cases, uh, particularly variances, um, this was kind of the case that we pushed that um, specific amendment through as it uh, now with the variance it deals with uh, the Fair Housing, Federal Fair Housing Act. So um, when that case comes in front of the board, you will, you will kind of see that new section in action. And at this time, uh, the thought is to just have this case uh, at the regular scheduled board of adjustment time, which is um, normally after the planning board meetings. So right now we're looking at the, uh, the last Monday in April. Yes. Yeah. Andrew, I just have a quick question. Is the variance application for existing, an existing dwelling or for a new dwelling? Um, not, it's an ex it's an existing. On, okay, sorry, sorry. Yeah, let's You're right. Not talk I'm about sorry. Any substance right now? Got it. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, guys. Other questions that don't relate to the substance. Michael Flake. More comment than a question, but I did want to echo just the a gratitude as a board member and a citizen for the folks who put in, I think 24 to 30 hours on the, the marathon hearing. We, uh, you didn't do it for the glamor. We really appreciate all the hard work you guys put into that. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, I, I, I think we're all happy to be on the other side right now. Um, anyone else? Okay. Uh, was there anything else on, BOA cases, I don't think there's anything that I'm aware of. No other of. BOA announcements right now. All right. Um, we will we will firm up that schedule, as Andrew mentioned. It's it's still tentative right now, and um, I'll, I'll get with the, the panel to confirm schedules and, and availability. But all right, next, next up on the planning staff report. Historic preservation. <clears throat> Lindsay Laird is actually the staff member that's leading this exercise. Uh, we're undertaking a historic preservation plan. And you've heard us mention this, but I have a little more substantive update for you this time. The town has actually hired Heritage Strategies to develop a townwide historic plan, historic preservation plan. The plan will serve as a guide for proactive preservation decision making over the course of the next 10 or 15 years. 
and it will synthesize our existing preservation efforts with the desires expressed by the community during the planning process. So please be, do, be, please be sure to participate uh, in this process and be on the lookout for a number of virtual opportunities to provide input in the coming months, including an online citizen survey. Um, they've, we've actually, Andrew and I have been involved in reviewing it as well. It, it, they've done a great job of, of really, I think, broadening the scope of what is preservation and, and what are things that we would consider preserving in our town. So make sure to look out for that. Uh, updates will be posted to the Historic Preservation Plan webpage. So if you go to townofdavidson.org backslash historic preservation plan, that's where you can get the latest information. That's townofdavidson.org backslash historic preservation plan. So that's the update there. Any questions on that? Yes, Ellen. Sorry, I just have a quick comment. Um, I've actually been asked to serve on the Historic Preservation Plan Steering Committee. So if any of you have thoughts or ideas that you'd like to share to get passed on, you know, would love to have the opportunity to speak with any of you about it. Thanks, Ellen. I appreciate that. Anyone else? Okay. All right, so next up is Andrew's got two items to round us out here tonight. The first is a discussion or just a quick update, I should say, on the Boulder Rock Loop public input session that occurred a week or two ago. Uh, yeah, we held the Boulder Rock Loop public input session on March 16th, and it was virtual. We had about 25 in attendance, and uh, nothing from the site plan had changed since uh, it was in front of this board in October. And I'm currently working with the project team to see if they have any revisions based on the comments we heard. And I'll say, um, I got a list here of the majority of the comments that uh, concerns we heard from the citizens. Um, one was about construction traffic on Boulder Rock Loop. Um, another was accessing the site through Davidson Park Place. Um, another one was safety of the residents of Davidson Park Place and the Woodlands as uh, this development will create additional traffic. Um, another one was the concern that there was no permanent access to the site or construction access to the site from Davidson Concord Road. Uh, we had some concerns about the speed limit on Davidson Concord Road still being too high, though it was reduced to 45, I believe, in 2016. And then we did have some uh, concerns about uh, removal of trees along the property boundary that borders the existing residential um, Davidson Park Place development. And I just wanted to give a quick update on the comments that we had heard. And of course, folks, you'll get a public input session report will be out, you know, posted to that project website when it's available in the coming week or so. And we'll keep you abreast of any changes in the plan, probably at the next planning board meeting, depending on how quickly the project team moves on this. Any questions for Andrew right now on that? Okay. Doesn't seem like there are any. Thank you, Andrew. Mm -hmm. So um, last item, Andrew and Matt, I don't know if, if you guys discussed who goes first or who. who no, you I'm, to, okay. I'm happy to defer to Andrew. Andrew, do you want to share this or do you want me to kind of set the table a little bit? Well, um, I know we'd been asked to kind of um, speak a little bit on the, the new development down in Cornelius that's uh, right on the basically the town jurisdiction line. And, and with that, I'll kind of um, let you set the table with, with sure, what you want. Sure. OK, so um, so folks, I, I'm sure a lot of you are aware um, there's a development occurring in Cornelius. It's wholly in Cornelius. Um, it's the old Mecklenburg, old Mecklenburg Brewery. Um, they're kind of partnering up with. Northwood Raven to do some multifamily along with the brewery site, um, along with some, I think some commercial involved in it as well. It's uh, adjacent to antiquity and the greenway that's there. Um, and then there's, there's that proposal on one lot. It's where the old screw um, company factory is. And then there's a separate lot that is closer to the bridge that would take you into antiquity along South Street. That is not, it's a separate development, but it, it, it kind of goes hand in hand in some ways. And in fact, was discussed during the presentation to the town of Cornelius commissioners on the OMB and Northwood Raven project. So all of this to say, 
we we need to be cognizant that obviously we're not talking about other towns plans we're not talking about the content of what they are allowed to do in their jurisdiction and, and whether they meet their code um what we probably have some ability to look at and, and certainly reason to look at is from a transportation and connectivity standpoint the the pros and cons of if they were to look to connect through to South Street on a portion, a little additional lot that um, is owned by one of those development teams that is actually in Davidson um, and, and how that could relate to the town. But just keep in mind that, that all of this, even the connection to South Street, it is feasible and, and it, it could be in fact what they are planning right now to connect to South Street just in front of the bridge and that's wholly in Cornelius. It doesn't come into Davidson at all. Um, so I just want us to be mindful of that in terms of looking at this. Um, obviously I think there there are pros and cons to this, this project, but, um, and Andrew, I think you, the reason we were looking for you to maybe provide some insight is that transportation question, how it may or may not relate um, any touch points with our mobility plan. And then also just the general they had done that feasibility study for 115 connectivity um, and identified that, that stretch through the, these developments as a way to connect 115 um, and, and try to alleviate some of the, the issues on 115. And with the uh, mobility plan, it does uh, recommend that we um, have um, conversations with our neighbors. And uh, we have had some conversations with uh, the Cornelius staff regarding this project. Um, they haven't had their TIAs official yet, um, so we haven't seen those, but they, they did tell us they would share the findings with, with the town of Davidson. Um, obviously, if the South Street connections in Cornelius, uh, there'll be just only so much that the town of Davidson can do. Um, and also, uh, going back uh, back in 2019, I believe it was, they adopted a, uh, Cornelius adopted a 115 study. And um, from that study, they adopted two elements, I should say. Um, one was improvements along 115, which um, basically adds some bicycle and pedestrian improvements from downtown up to the town limit in Davidson. And the second section was um, what is referred to, I guess, as the antiquity bypass. And it, it is that connection from basically Zion Street over to South Street. And as part of this development, that section of road would be built by developers from what we can tell from the preliminary plans. That makes sense with everyone. Zion Street is the street that runs parallel to the railroad tracks uh, on, on the antiquity development side of the railroad tracks there. Um, I, I, I would venture to guess that most have not driven where this part is, but it's where they would be turning in to go into the planned OMB and Northwood Raven development. A road that would come in off of Zion would flow through all the way down to where South Street connects, and, and you have the bridge there. You turn right to go across the bridge into Antiquity. You would go left um, up towards Davidson, and again, the lot that is owned right now that is anticipated, we've not seen any plans. I don't think um, last time I checked, Cornelius didn't have one yet from that development. Um, you'll recall it formerly was the development known as Antiquity Woods. Uh, it's different now. It's a different team. Um, but anyway, so there's a, there's a place where that road could connect all the way through the South Street in Cornelius jurisdiction. And then there's also a separate area that if they were to look to make the roadway connect, it would cross a... a portion of Davidson to get to South Street and it's just not clear exactly where that road is is proposed right now if it comes across Davidson you'd be talking about interlocal agreements and stuff that's just above our pay grade but anyway um, I, I know that interest had been shared to talk about the project it's obviously a, again I, from my perspective um, and I think we often talk about this on this board it, it's got pros and cons you know obviously it's it's got a lot of um, not rooftops, but unit count. And um, it also brings a brewery and it's, I would encourage everyone to look at the plans and some of the, the, 
the intentions for utilization of the natural resources that are there, integrating it with the greenway that Cornelius has been expanding that does connect to Davidson's greenway um, just south of the elementary school, um, which if you've not been on it, comes behind the pines, runs down Pine Road. It's, it's a nice little stretch of greenway. Um, and for what it's worth, the folks in, in, in antiquity that spoke at the Cornelius Commissioner's meeting, they were pretty, pretty high on it. They were pretty much in favor of that plan. So, you know, again, I think our, our purview is the transportation element, if anything. But um, it, this was for discussion or any comments that, that anyone might want to bring up um, tonight. Mike Flake. Uh, maybe a couple of questions for Andrew. Andrew, do, does the town own a little sliver over there? Am I remembering that right? Yeah, if, um, if Trey, if you want to let me share my screen, I can kind of um, go ahead and show where, the, um, where this is located. Is that working now, Andrew? Yes. Okay, uh, if you can see, can everybody see the uh, Polaris image? Yes. All right, basically uh, this portion right here would be where the uh, OMB section of the development would be. And then this piece here would be the, the second piece that uh, the chairman had mentioned. And this line right here, this red line is basically the jurisdictional line between Davidson and Cornelius. So you know, we have some frontage on South Street. These two properties here are both located in Davidson, where if it would connect down this way, it would stay totally in Cornelius. And then the road is, is basically going to parallel the, the current greenway. And, and then Andrew? Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Mike. I was going to say, my other question to Andrew was, it sounds like the town staffs have been talking. Is it, uh, are we aware of elected officials speaking to each other? It's Because it sounds like uh, an equitable solution might might equally or better be found at that level. Do, are you aware? Um, I haven't been uh, informed of any conversations between the elected, so I, I can't add anything to that. Okay, thank you. So, so Andrew, those um, those little that one triangular and then I guess a rhombus or tra trapezoid um, are those owned by the are they owned by the town of of Davidson? Just one. Uh, this one down here, the, the pizza shaped one is yeah, where the 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 rhombus one looks like it's owned as uh, as Matt said, it's owned by the same person that owns this piece, the developer, basically. All right. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. All right. Well, um, if you do have questions, feel free to reach out to Trey or Andrew on this. And uh, I, I do think that um, if you've tracked our commissioners, they recently indicated that they were interested in, in taking a look at it. And um, so you may hear more about it from their, from their side. Um, but that's, that, I think that's the, was, was the aim for tonight, just to kind of give an, an FYI, help frame the scope of where we may or may not have a voice and um, just kind of clue everyone in. Um, you'll probably hear some folks in town discuss it. Um, and it's always worth being at least alert and aware. So if there are no other questions about that, uh, I think that gets us to the end of our meeting and it's 6.54, um, just to make note of that. And so I'm gonna ask for a motion to adjourn, assuming there's not some hot topic that someone really needs to raise right now. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn, this quick one from Susan. Second. Second, <laughs> second from Nora, all in favor, show of hands. Perfect. All right. We are adjourned. That's everything.